All right, well, good afternoon, everybody. This is Randy Alfred with the Air Resources Board. Um, we're going to get going here in just a second. I got a couple of th things that I need to take care of before we can. First thing I need to know is if everybody can hear us or hear me at the moment. Uh, if you, if somebody would please respond in the questions dialog box at the audio go good job. Thanks, Adriana. Um, myself and Katie King are here with you this afternoon. Katie, do you want to say hi? Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. All right, Katie and I are going to be sharing duties this afternoon to give you the information uh, about course 522. This is a, a course that provides an overview of the regulations pertaining to public agencies in the state of California. Let's go through a couple more things as far as housekeeping is concerned, and then we'll get into the material because I know everybody wants the information. A couple things that you've got going for you right now is that Katie and I are going to be sharing the presentation duties. I'll be doing the first few sections, and she's going to polish up the end with the off-road regulation talk. Uh, all this information is in a compressed format, so to speak, only because we've got so many regulations to talk about. So I will be going through them, Katie will be going through them, but there are longer versions of each of these topics. There are a couple things you need to be aware of. First of all, let me see if we actually have it in here. Uh, we didn't upload the handouts. Katie, did you make a handout for this? Yeah, I have one. I'll go ahead and upload it. Okay, so Katie's going to upload the handout. If you wonder where I'm looking at the moment, on the dialog box that most of you or all of you hopefully have on the right-hand side of your screen, down around the bottom there will say handouts 005. Once she gets the handout uploaded, it'll be a PDF file. That should say, file, say handouts 105, and there it goes. It's starting off. So you can download that at your leisure during the presentation. Once we're done with the presentation, that will no longer be available to you. I'd be happy to send it to you. Katie would be happy to send it to you, but you, you should download it while we're going at this uh, before we close the thing out. Uh, if you want to know how to email us, I put the emails on the, uh, the first slide so that you have those. And uh, the last thing I think we should talk about is the fact that this is being recorded. So all of our webinars are recorded. We keep copies of them uh, in the go to webinar meeting space. Uh, they are available somewhere between one to three hours after each of our presentations. If you want to review the information again uh, at some later time, that's fine. All you got to do is send Katie or I an email and we can send you the link for the recording. If you ask for that, make sure it's either you know, within a couple of hours. I can't send it to you right away because they have to convert it to an MP4 file format before they can um, allow it to be out. Anyway, that's what we're going to do, uh, and I guess I forgot one thing, but you've already been doing it. If you have a question during the presentation, the questions dialog box on the right-hand side is where we want you to put that question. If you've never done the webinar thing before, when you put that in there, uh, Katie is monitoring that at the moment. When there's a question, she'll try to answer that question. If she cannot answer that question or feels it's a question that should be brought to the entire class, She'll stop my presentation, and I'll do the same for her if, during the off-road, and she'll ask the question to the class so it can be answered out loud and be part of the recording. Uh, but as we go along, if you have questions, that's where you should be posing them. All right, with that, let's get to the information. Here are the regulations we're going to be talking about today. We'll hit the PAU regulation, Periodic Smoke Inspection Program. I'll talk briefly about idling limitations in the state of California. Then I'll talk about a brief introduction to the Portable Equipment Registration Program and the associated airborne toxic control measure. Then I will turn the control of the presentation over to Katie, and she'll finish up with the off-road regulation. But first, let's see if I can get it there. I got to give you a little bit of regulatory background. It wouldn't be the same if we didn't do this. I have to do this for each of our presentations, just so you know where we're coming from and why we even have these regulations. One of the things that drives people in my agency to do what they do is the data you see on the screen. Now, all over this country and every metropolitan, every major metropolitan area, there are air monitoring sites that are monitoring what's called the ambient air all around us. That's the air that you and I breathe. And each of these monitoring sites is trying to pick up a variety of different pollutants. Now, the ones we're focusing on with this presentation happen to be particulate matter and ozone because we're dealing mostly with diesel engine regulations. And the two the substances coming from a diesel engine have most impact on these two pollutants. 
The air monitoring sites, as I said, are gathering information all the time. Now that data is collected by whomever owns the site, but at some point it winds up in the federal government's coffers at EPA, and they publish the data. It's free to anyone that wants to look at it, but because it's health related, they can't not publish it actually. There's a double negative for you. Anyway, um, one of the organizations that uses this data every year is the American Lung Association. And they look at the top 300 metropolitan locations in the state in the United States and rank each of those locations based on the number of times one of these monitoring sites gets a reading that is considered unsafe to breathe. And that level is known. It's a known quantity because we've had many university studies and many internal studies, and it's it's been known for a long time what level is going to hurt someone if they breathe it. Well, anyway, the American Lung Association takes that data. And when they rank these cities, the more times they get a reading that is unsafe to breathe, the higher up on the list that particular location gets. Right now on the screen, you're looking at the top 10 worst places in the country to live based on particulate matter pollution and ozone pollution. I don't want that to go by too easily. These are the top 10 worst places to live. One thing that should become abundantly clear to anybody with their eyes open right now is that California is not having a good day, not having a good year, and not having a good time when it comes to these pollutants. We send, tend to win this contest, if you really want to call it a contest, on an annual basis. I've been doing this for 30 years. I've been looking at this data for more than 20 years, and we always seem to come out on top as far as the worst places. Anyway, this is what drives people at the Air Resources Board to come to work and to do their jobs. We also have to take a look at what has been done by our agency in order to help mitigate the problem you just saw on that previous slide. We're a regulatory agency. We write regulations and we enforce regulations. What you're looking at on the screen now is a subset, it's most of them, but it's a subset of all the diesel regulations that have been put in place since the year 1998 in California. Why is 1998 important? Well, because 1998 was when the Air Resources Board designated diesel particulate matter as something called a toxic airborne contaminant. I'm not gonna go into a long discussion on that. If you wanna find out more information, we have scads and loads and tons of information on our websites about that program. Just suffice it to say that any time a substance is designated as a TAC, it forces our agency to write regulations to mitigate the exposure of that substance to our population. So every single one of these regulations on the screen came about because of that designation. And you can see that there's an order that started back in 2000 with urban buses, went on to garbage trucks, so on and so forth. And you get down to the very last one on this slide that says, uh, well, not the, the second to last, periodic smoke inspection program in 2018, and then the off-road agricultural vehicle regulation, which is not technically a reg regulation. We actually had that regulation in process and watch what happens, I'm gonna make a drop off. We were putting together a rule that would make farmers across the state of California get rid of their old equipment and, make, and buy new. And we had such a, a terrific, horrific time implementing the truck and bus rule as well as the off-road uh, regulation that we'll talk about later that we decided to take a different approach. And the reason I talk about this is because I want people to understand that we're not just laser focused on writing more restrictive regulation. If something happens, if people participate in the process, there is an opportunity to change the path that our agency takes. And in this case, we had enough pushback uh, dealing with that particular topic and that particular rule that was shelved. And the, 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 what we're trying to do now is we're trying to take the same type of controls, but we're trying to entice farmers to buy new equipment rather than forcing them to buy new equipment. If any of you live and work in the Central Valley, uh, then you have access to something called the Farmer Program, which is a funding program for farmers. And it uh, gives money to those that wish to purchase new equipment, not necessarily brand new, but equipment that's newer than what they have. Anyway, that's the deal. We won't be talking about all these regulations here, but we will be talking about the ones that are highlighted. And the first of those is the Public Agency and Utility Regulation, which was passed and promulgated in 2005. 
Um, I'll use this term periodically because it's the term that is used by anyone in my agency when we discuss this topic. We call it the PAU, not the public. We don't just say the whole words. It's called the PAU. Anyway, this regulation applies to, uh, well, let me get it up here. It applies to any vehicle owned and operated or leased by a municipality or public agency in the state of California. So what we're talking about here are cities, counties, and state vehicles, as well as those quasi-public entities like private public utilities. And there's kind of a combination thing going on there. There are some utilities that are fully publicly owned, some that are fully privately owned, and then some that are kind of in the middle. But if they're a utility, they fall under this regulation. Now, there is one difference between the two types of utilities, though, and it's right there on the slide. Public utilities fall under this regulation and will continue to fall under this regulation uh, until some other regulation is put in place that I don't even know is, uh, is happening. If you are a private utility or work for a private utility, then this regulation is yours until the end of this year. The end of this year, all the trucks that would normally be in this rule for a private utility will start to follow the truck and bus regulation. And that is an incredibly important thing for any of those agencies to understand because the truck and bus regulation has additional requirements in it that the PAU regulation does not. Uh, to give you an example of the difference between public and private, I live in the Sacramento area. We have two major utilities here. We have SMUD, which is the Sacramento Municipal Utility District. That is a public entity. And then you have PG&E, which is across the state. That's Pacific Gas and Electric. That is a private utility. Both of them fall under the PAU now, but PG&E will be following the truck and bus regulations starting January of next year. So anyway, that's, those are the agencies and entities that fall under the rule. What are we talking about as far as the equipment? This is any diesel vehicle, commercial on-road diesel vehicle, owned and operated or leased by one of those organizations I just spoke of that weighs more than 14,000 pounds gross vehicle weight rating. It applies to any model year from 1960 and newer. Uh, and the requirement is, again, it has to be a diesel engine, it has to be an on-road mobile engine like a truck or something like that, and it has to weigh at least 14,001 pounds. The, there's a phrase used to describe these vehicles that uh, is, is, is common vernacular. It's been used for as long as I've been doing this, and it's called white fleet vehicles. So I, I believe the reason that is is because if you look at a lot of the cities, they'll categorize their vehicles by the, the color paint that they use. And their white fleet vehicles are all pickup trucks and all the uh, bucket trucks and everything else. So that's the vehicles we're talking about. There are some exemptions associated with this rule. Uh, these are actually fairly common to many of our rules. Emergency vehicles are exempt from most of our regulations. So are military tactical vehicles. Off-road vehicles, even though they may be owned by a municipality, do not fall under this rule because they fall under the off-road diesel vehicle rule. So you don't put them under two things. Now, school buses, that's a different thing entirely because even though those are typically you know, publicly owned vehicles, it was initially thought that we were not going to regulate school buses. It was thought to be politically incorrect. And then someone had the brilliant thought that, you know what, those school buses affect one of the more sensitive parts of our population. We really should be regulating school buses. So they did become regulated, but because this rule had already been passed and was already in place, our agency decided to put the school buses into the truck and bus rule. So that's where they reside. They don't reside in this. They have basically the same requirement, but they fall under different regulation. Also, solid waste collection vehicles and public transit buses do not fall under this rule. That's because as I showed you on that slide with all the variety of regulation, they have their own rules just for those type of vehicles. So they wouldn't also fall under this one. It's vehicles that are not exempt. So I've already called the white fleet vehicles, but school district vehicles, not the school buses would be in this because schools are public entities. Airport shuttles, college for colleges and universities, uh, they would fall under this rule. Solid waste transfer trucks, and I, it took me a long time to figure out the difference between that, but a solid waste collection vehicle is basically your garbage truck. A solid waste transfer truck 
uh, it actually picks up a, a whole trailer and brings it somewhere and transfers it to a different place. So it's it's not exactly the same thing. Um, solid waste collection vehicles fall under one rule. The transfer trucks fall under this rule. And I know that gets confusing, uh, but the, once you understand what the requirements are, they're the same either way. The requirements for the solid waste collection vehicle rule and the PAU are both the same. The, those requirements are that all engine model years had to um, be 100% covered by something called best available control technology or BAT. And for anybody that anybody that was operating one of these vehicles in a non-low population county, that had to happen by December 31st, 2012. We're nearly eight years past that. Now, what is best available control technology? I'll say this more than once, it's basically a filter. It's basically a diesel particulate filter. Now, when this rule was put in place, diesel particulate filters were not prevalent. They, they did exist, but they weren't available for everything. So there were some other options built into the rule that qualified as best available control technology. But today where we are is if somebody if, at a regulatory agency like mine says you have to apply back to a diesel vehicle, that generally and almost exclusively is going to mean a filtration system. So I did mention low population counties. Low population counties is a designation that we put into this rule and the off-road diesel vehicle regulation, which separates out those counties and outlying areas that had lower populations and gives them more time to comply. We'll talk about all that, but the initial compliance deadline had an additional five years for those counties if they weren't following anything specific that was allowed. That specific allowance was something called accelerated turnover. Now, accelerated turnover, I never really will understand why it's called this because it's really a, uh, a non-accelerated turnover. So if, if you had a low population county status and you decided to opt into something called accelerated turnover, that meant you didn't have to do anything. You didn't have to do anything until 2020. And then 2020, uh, anything you had that was uh, 94, and every, anything you had that was older than a 1994 engine had to be basically gone. And anything that was 94 or newer you could keep running it as you did before, but it had to have a filter by 2025. So that was a big deal for a lot of those agencies. Anyway, if you're wondering whether or not you're following accelerated turnover, uh, I'm, I'm not sure I have an easy way of finding that information. It had to be done through an application process. And as I said earlier, private utilities had to follow the truck and bus or will follow the truck and bus starting next year. Other vehicles that are exempt, but not from this regulation, just from having to apply filtration, are those that are considered low use. So I'll talk about that in a, mu a minute more. Those that are low use in low population counties and anything that is dedicated to removing snow from the roads only. What is low use? Well, low use is any vehicle, any standard low use vehicle that can go less than 1,000 miles per year and operate if it does stationary operation, less than 50 hours per year. In a low population county, you just multiply that by three. They get 3,000 miles per year uh, and 150 hours per year. Now, there is no reporting system associated with this. This is a record keeping only situation. However, uh, it is something that we have had some issues with some counties that we've done audits on where they have not kept enough records to attain the low use designation because you have to have five years of records to demonstrate a vehicle has kept to that low use standard. It is a five year rolling average. Now, what does qualify for back? I already went through the fact that it's a diesel particular filter, but there are some other things that can be included. If you purchase a newer vehicle, one that came with a filter from the factory, that's automatically gonna qualify as backed. Uh, if you have a vehicle that was certified to a particular standard and then retrofit with a, a, a verified diesel emission control system or a filter, then that's also considered back. If you didn't want to go down the filtration route, you could always turn the vehicle over into using some type of alternative fuel, like gasoline or uh, heavy-duty pilot ignition engines or natural gas or something like that. Those would also be considered back. 
interestingly enough, in this rule, there was also a back, which I don't have on the slide here, but there was a, a way you could earn backed credit in this rule by selling older vehicles out of state. And that has actually caused some problems for people purchasing vehicles in online auctions because one of the stipulations in this rule was that if you sold a vehicle to get back to credit, first of all, it had to be outside the state of California where the vehicle was going. And secondly, that vehicle had to have a DMV, a permanent DMV registration hold placed on it so that it could never come back to operate in the state of California again. Well, what has happened with that more times than I can count is that somebody has purchased a vehicle from out of state, legally purchased it, they bought it at auction somewhere, it was an old municipal vehicle, and they were not informed when they purchased the vehicle that it had a reg hold. They didn't find that out until they tried to register it here in California, and lo and behold, they can't use that vehicle here, at least not legally. All right, that's backed. You could also, that this is the retirement. I, I guess I had a whole slide on that. Um, it, was, it was a reg hold, a bin stop, whatever you want to call it. That was something that you could do to qualify for backed. You could also dismantle the engine or convert it to low use. If you did any of that, as I said earlier, there was no and is no reporting system for this regulation. It's a record keeping requirement. I, I put these in the presentation just so you know how it went. These are all historic now because they're, they're more than eight years past or just about eight years past when the last time frame was for compliance. But this rule had something called a phase in. It wasn't requiring people to put everything in all at once. It was a considered a turnover, which told uh, agencies that had particular types of vehicles that they had to, to install or get some type of best available control technology on them at certain levels in certain years. Anyway, at this point, it's 100%. Here are the low population counties. These were designated to have less than 125,000 people in them as of July 1st, 2005. Uh, one of the questions we get periodically is, are you ever gonna add to this? And the answer is no. These are the low population counties as they were designated back then. And this is what it is now. This is what it's gonna be. This is the schedule for any of those areas. See how it pushed it out for some of the engines all the way out till 2017. Accelerated turnover, I did mention this, and it's only important to you if you work and operate vehicles that fall under this rule in those low population counties that I showed you before. It required you to replace anything that was older, had an engine that was older in 1994 by the beginning of this year. And then the remaining vehicles, your 94 to 9, or 2006, which did not come from the factory with filtration systems, are supposed to have filters installed on them by January 1st of 2025. By the way, you can't get into this provision anymore. You had to have applied for it back before the rule uh, actually had 100% compliance rates. Uh, so qualifying for low population county, here's one of the rest of that information. Uh, you know, you, you you had to have applied for it, you had to have the county size, all that good stuff that I mentioned already. I don't know how many times I can say this and make sure everybody gets the idea, but I'll say it again. This is a record keeping requirement for the most part. You have to have the back applied to the vehicles, but there is no reporting system associated with this rule. You have to, there's two main types of record keeping that we want you to have related to this. The first is just data on the vehicles themselves. And then the second is stickers like you see shown there. These are stickers or labels that are required on certain vehicles in your fleet. They would be vehicles that had filtration systems installed on them as a retrofit, as well as those vehicles that are designated as low use or low use in low population counties. The label requirements uh, were that they had to be in durable and legible, and they had to all be on the vehicles by December 31st of 2007. We wanted them on a door jam on the driver's side, but really, if we find them anywhere, we'll accept it. We just want to be able to read the information. The type of labels that we have had in the past include one that was for compliant, one that was for low use. There were some that were on an experimental basis, and then low population county. This is what one looks like that would be a good deal. 
So I can read this. This is the city of Los Angeles. It's, they got their truck number on there. That ECS number is the uh, filtration system family name. So that tells us what filter in the filter family. This is an ECS filter that was installed back in 2004. So I like that. I can read it. I can do my enforcement. If I see this one, I cannot do anything. This one at one point probably was fairly legible, but for some reason it was not kept that way. I understand things wear out, but for doing enforcement, if I can't read the label, it's like the label is not there. So you, you would get a citation if I were inspecting and found this particular label, because it doesn't tell me anything. Some common areas of non-compliance with this rule are mostly related to records. So every time we've done an audit on a municipality that falls under this rule, it is like pulling teeth trying to get the appropriate records. A lot of times the records are not kept with the vehicle. They're in some centralized location, and those people don't even know what they have half the time. So trying to get the stuff that allows us to audit a particular fleet has sometimes been practically impossible. We don't automatically write citations to municipalities for that. We, uh, most of the time when we've audited a, a fleet for this regulation, it's been something where we've gone back and forth and back and forth and, and tried to work as hard as we can to make sure that if they have the information available that we get to see it. Uh, the other things that are listed here, at labels, that's been a problem since the beginning. The third party sellers, that's what I was mentioning about those vehicles being sold out of state that had VIN holds on them. So uh, it is something that can still happen. It's less likely now than ever before because of the age of the vehicles, but it is what it is. Now, there's also a problem with any municipality or agency that falls under this rule hiring outside people to do work. Because let's say I'm a school or I work for a school and I run the, the, the school, um, I don't know, whatever, that uses vehicles. Uh, their, their bus program or their repair program. And I decide that instead of having my guys do it because they're busy doing other things, I'm going to hire somebody, contract labor, to come in and take care of some of the stuff that needs to be done. Even though I'm the hiring person or entity, and they are coming in to do work for a municipal agency, those vehicles that they're using do not fall under this rule. Those are commercial on-road vehicles, and most likely, depending on what it is, they would fall under the truck or bus rule. So there are different requirements, and the truck and bus rule actually has a requirement that if you're hiring somebody with a vehicle that falls under that rule, you have to verify that those vehicles are compliant. So even though they might be compliant with the PAU rule, the truck and bus has a higher standard. So you have to be a little careful about that kind of thing. All right, let's talk about the next regulation. And I guess, let me stop there and go back one slide here. I want to give you a couple of takeaways, if I can, for most of these. The takeaways for public agency and utility regulation are, number one, there's no reporting system. Uh, number, well, should, that's number two. Number one is compliance means filtration. If you have one of these vehicles, diesel, on-road, over 14,000 pounds, it needs to have a filter or be a newer vehicle with an OEM filter. That's compliance. Number two is there is no reporting system. It is a record keeper keeping only regulation. Number three is just make sure if you have vehicles that need labels, that those labels are in place and they say what they need to say so that uh, if you ever get inspected, which actually has happened out in the field, we do and have inspected some of these vehicles in some of our roadside areas, that the labels are there for our inspectors to see. If they aren't there, then you're going to get a citation. All right, those are the three takeaways. Let's get into the public agency, no, I'm sorry, the PSIP program, Periodic Smoke Inspection Program, or PSIP. This is a program that has actually been in place since 1998. It is one of the oldest, if not the oldest, regulation in California dealing with diesel engines. It is for testing the level of smoke coming from a diesel engine. So essentially, this is a smog check for a diesel vehicle. The problem we have with smog checking diesel vehicles is currently, even though there are some pieces of equipment that can do dyno testing, they're extremely expensive and there is no program currently set up to require that. 
So we had to have some other mechanism for doing what's called in-use compliance. Now, the, the main difference between in-use and fleet regulations is the fact that a fleet regulation will require agencies and owners to clean their equipment up, but it does nothing to see if they keep that equipment maintained properly. There's two sides of that coin. If you don't keep the maintained maintenance going up, then all the requirements to put equipment on there to clean the engines up don't mean hardly anything because eventually those engines will get to produce more. So more pollution. So we have to have a, an in-use regulation that kind of marries with the fleet regulation. And that's what this does. This rule provides a mechanism for our guys and owners to determine how well their engines are being maintained because it monitors the level of pollution coming from a vehicle while it is in use, after it has been cleaned up, supposedly. This program has been around, as I said, since 1998. It goes by a lot of different names. If the inspection that we're talking about is performed by one of the Air Resources Board inspectors, it's called the Heavy Duty Vehicle Inspection Program, or HDVIP. If the inspection is being done by the owner of the piece of equipment, and that's called the Periodic Smoke Inspection Program, or PSIP. It also goes by some common names. You might hear it called the Opacity Test, or the SNAP Test, or the SNAP Acceleration Test, or the Smog Test for Diesel Vehicles. There's a number of, oh, there's the, the SEE one, Society of Automotive Engineers International. That's called J1667. Anyway, it doesn't matter what you go by, they're all the same tests. Now, the Heavy Duty Vehicle Inspection Program, as I said, is performed by our inspectors. We have our own equipment, we train our people, they do the inspection, they do a lot of those on an annual basis, thousands of them actually. Um, that's part of our regular roadside enforcement program. The requirement for this regulation is that if you meet the conditions I'm gonna go over in just a second, you are supposed to do this test on your own vehicles each year. And that requirement applies to those organizations, entities, or people that own two or more California-based diesel vehicles with a gross vehicle weight rating of more than 6,000 pounds. If you are one of those people, if you are one of those entities, if you have two or more vehicles, diesel on-road commercial vehicles, over 6,000 pounds, gross weight, then you're supposed to be conducting this test on each of those vehicles each year. For the most part, there is one exclusion. That is if it's a brand new vehicle with a brand new engine. Any engine that is four years, let's see, less than four years old is not, does not have to be tested. I wanna bring this home, so I'm gonna give you an example. So I own a truck, right? I have one truck, it's over 6,000 diesel on road. I do not meet the condition because it says I have to have two or more. So I do not have a requirement if I'm an owner operator. Let's say I have two trucks. One of them is a 2000 model year engine. The other is brand new and I just bought it. Nice shiny 2020. The engine is probably 2019. Doesn't matter, brand new. That engine is less than four years old. I have two vehicles. I have two commercial vehicles greater than 6,000 on road diesel. So I'm part of the test. I have to conduct the test, but I don't have to conduct it on the new vehicle until it, its engine gets to be four years old. I have to conduct it on my older one, and then when the new one gets four years old, when it turns four years, it's part of the testing protocol as well. All right, hopefully everybody got that. Let's talk about what the limitations are and what the requirements are. So when this rule was put in place back in 1998, we didn't have any of these other diesel vehicle regulations. We did not have diesel particulate filters. They were a new phenomenon to us, and they were something that we were just looking at requiring. So the opacity levels, or the amount of smoke that was allowed to come out of the engines, was significantly higher than what it is today. In fact, the original opacity limits shown there on the screen were if you had a 91 or newer model year engine, you were allowed to blow 40% opacity, which is pretty dark, uh, before you get a fail on this test. If you have an older than 1991 engine, you got even more, 55% opacity. Those limits have been lowered with the advent of filtration systems. Because the filtration systems actually remove 99.9% .9 of the soot coming from these diesel engines, 
those levels from the previous writing of this rule are way too high. So when we changed the rule back in 2017 and 2018, we lowered the opacity limits. We also, at that time, since we were going into the rule, set more stringent requirements for the for training related to doing the test, and we offered some uh, something you could do in lieu of the test. So let's go through those. First of all, here are the new opacity levels. If you have a diesel particulate filter, uh, whether it's a retrofit or OEM, you have a 5% cap on emissions coming from that to pass this test. If you go over 5%, it's a fail. If you're 5% or less, it is a pass. Uh, that should not be a complicated thing. If you have a diesel truck that is well-maintained with a good diesel particulate filter, you will have no problem meeting that, that level because most diesel particulate filters, when you go through the opacity, test will blow somewhere around a zero, 0 0.1, something like that. All right, so there are other opacity limits there on the screen as well. Those are for vehicles that do not have filtration systems. And you may be asking, what vehicles are those? Well, those vehicles are ones that are under low use or have some exemption from having filtration. If that's you, then you have an opacity level allowed before you get a fail based on the model year of the engine. The older the engine is, the higher the opacity. Uh, with relation to the public agency and utility regulation, you may have an engine that's equipped with something called a level two filtration system. Now, filters come in three different flavors, level ones, level twos, and level threes. It has been the standing of this agency and the understanding for a long time that whichever level is currently available for your vehicle when we require it, whatever the highest one is, is the one that you have to install. For most vehicles, that is going to be a level three filter but the public agency and utility regulation was put in place early enough that there were not level three filters available for all vehicles we were requiring to be filtered. So therefore we allowed level twos to be installed on some of these trucks. That is a lower level of control. It's unacceptable today, but because they were allowed to do it back then, if you still have one of those vehicles in operation, it is still legal to operate and they do get a higher opacity level allowance. There are also a higher one for the uh, two engine cranes uh, driven by a non-DPF off-road engine. I really don't know how many of those there are, but um, those those vehicles can put out a significant amount of smoke and they there's not really much you can do to control them. So they get a higher level too. All right, so for the testing or training requirements, you got two different things that can happen here. First of all, it, you have to do this test every year on each of your vehicles. You could hire somebody to do it. There are testers all over the state of California that will come to your place of business and conduct this test on all of your vehicles every year. In fact, um, I know a couple of companies that do this and they're very good at it, but they will charge you for that service. If you hire somebody to do the test for you, whatever their charge is, whatever that is, that's between you and them. But from our side of things, whoever's conducting that test has to be certified to conduct that test. And the only way they can get certified is by attending a training course at one of the local community colleges that offers something called the CC Debt Program. Uh, it's a one day training course that certifies everybody that takes it to be a legal tester in the state of California. That training has to be repeated every four years. And there's a, a website that you can go to right there on the screen that will show you what which schools there are. Now I can tell you there are eight of them in the state of California. We've got one in the Sacramento area. We've got two in the Bay Area. We've got one in the Central Valley, two in the Los Angeles Basin, and two in the San Diego area. It doesn't matter which one you go to, they all offer the exact same training course. Uh, and it's only good for four years, as I said. So my advice to you, if you're hiring somebody to do this test, you should ask them for a copy of their certificate from that training, and you should verify that it's no, not more than eight or four years old. All right, so that's the one possibility. The second possibility for testing would be if you did the test yourself or you had one of your employees do it on your vehicles. It used to be that there was no training requirement for anybody that decided to go that direction. Now there is. With, with the advent of this, the changes in this rule, it is required that anybody conducting the test on their own vehicles go through an online training course. MS 529 is the course number. You can get there through our website where you sign up for all of our classes and it offers you the ability to certify as a smoke tester for your own equipment. Now that also has a time limit on it. I believe it's four years. Uh, you 
take that, it's an online training course uh, where you would just sit through a module, answer some questions. You have to get, I believe, 70% of them correct before you can go to the next module. Once you go through all the modules and get that, that level of correct, then you will be given a certificate of completion and you will be emailed a uh, tester number. Now, the tester number is something that you have to enter into the testing device. Otherwise, it is not a valid test. Anyway, those are the choices. There has to be some training associated with anybody conducting that test. There are uh, still record keeping requirements. This, this is not, uh, well, I should say, it. this is another regulation where there is not a standard reporting system and never has been. This is a record keeping requirement. You keep the records for, of your opacity testing for two years, and the only time we wanna see them is when we ask for them because we're auditing your vehicles. You do have an option, however, if you have newer equipment. So if any of you in the audience that have this requirement own and operate diesel vehicles that have 2013 or newer model year engines, those vehicles are equipped with something called onboard diagnostics. And onboard diagnostics, that's essentially the computer system that runs the vehicle's engine and all the associated equipment. That those things track everything. And it is what allows you to possibly, if you want, bypass doing the snap acceleration test. Because if you have an OBD equipped vehicle, then there's a little, what they call it a dongle. It's a little uh, um, plug that you have underneath your dash that you can uh, connect the device to and download data from your OBD system. If you download those files, you can submit them to the website shown right there and that will suffice as your test for that year. Now going forward, there will be a change coming. It's in the works right now. We have staff at the Air Resources Board working diligently with the staff of the Bureau of Automotive Repair to create a more robust inspection and maintenance program for heavy duty diesel trucks. Inspection and maintenance, if that doesn't ring a bell, think smog check. Our current biennial smog inspection program that your gasoline vehicles are required to go through is an INM program, an inspection and maintenance, an in-use program like I described early on. As I said earlier, we don't currently have one of those for most diesel vehicles, uh, just the ones from 6,000 to 14,000, uh, but the bigger ones, anything over 14, does not have a requirement, but it will in some parts of the state. Like I said, we're working on that. It's something that we believe is going to come about somewhere in the 2023 timeframe. So we'll be looking for that requirement. All right, let me go back one. Give Hi, you a Randy. couple of things. We've got we did questions. have a comment. So for the PSIP, um, the two years of records are required even for trucks that are no longer in the fleet. So even if they sell or scrap the truck, they do need to keep the PSIP test on file for that. Okay, that's good to know. I actually, I think I did know that. I just didn't repeat it. We have and then we did have another question while I have you, but I'm not sure what regulation they're referring to. Um, okay. Is the requirement still to meet 0 0.01 grams per brake horsepower hour? Yeah, that's talking about a filtration device. That's the truck and bus, as well as the PAU regulation. That when you say the word back to best available control technology in reference to a diesel on-road vehicle. That's the actual emission rate that's associated with a level three, you know, installed OEM filter. So, um, yeah, there, that is the public aid, the PAU and the truck and bus requirement is to have a vehicle that ultimately meets that. That would be a 2007 a newer model year engine. Uh, is that it, Katie? And then just as another note, the VIN stop process was canceled by DMV in 2017. I think when you're referencing that, you're probably just talking about the, uh, like, registration holds in general yeah. but they did used to refer to them as the VIN stop process so okay. now it's a registration I I, hold. Yeah I think I said reg hold and then um, we have VIN stop on the slide so we probably ought to take care of that. Oh yeah we just maybe need to delete that one then. Yeah I like okay. it when we have, we have uh, program people listening because they correct everything so it's good. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so um, takeaways, I, I think we just got them. All right, so we, we've got all the takeaways for this. Just be aware that if you have two or more diesel vehicles over 6,000 pounds operating on, on road in California, based in California, that you have this requirement. And it is something that you need to stay on top of. Uh, it also comes in handy if you're trying to 
bring a vehicle into compliance that uh, you owned for some time, but was not in compliance. We've had the issue with the truck and bus regulation where since it's been tied to DMV registration, there have been a number of people that were kind of sliding with their vehicles, thinking that they didn't have to worry about it. If nobody came out to, to see them. And now they're finding out that they can't slide anymore because it's associated with their registration. Uh, so they want to bring those vehicles into compliance. And when we, we ask for information to, for them to show us what they're doing, one of the pieces of information that we almost always, in fact, I think always ask for is their uh, opacity test data. So it's a good idea to keep that and have it available in case something happens related to enforcement with these regulations. All right, uh, commercial idling. So I'm gonna talk about a couple of different versions of idling. I'm not sure I got all three of them in here because one of them is strictly associated with off-road equipment, but let's go for it. So uh, if you didn't already know this, there are idling limitations in the state of California. There are idling limitations in a number of states, but California was more or less the first one to come up with this kind of program. In our state, it applies to any vehicle that is greater than 10,000 pounds of diesel fueled commercial on road, and it is a five minute non-essential idling limitation. Non-essential is the key phrase because essentially what that means, or basically what that means, is that uh, the vehicle does not need to be operating at the time. If it doesn't need to be operating, the engine operating, then that's not essential. If it has a function that it is performing that is essential to its operation and idling is part of that, then there is no limit. I'll give you an example. So I teach classes for Caltrans and a lot of Caltrans uh, operators drive light bar trucks. You've all seen them on the road when they're doing construction projects. They have a truck that is facing backwards with a, an arrow bar thing on the top of it and it's telling you to move to one side of the road. Those are for safety purposes, and a lot of those vehicles are large enough to be over the 10,000 pound class. They're running diesel, they're on road, they're over 10,000, they have an idling limitation. However, if they're in the road providing a safety function and idling, because if they weren't, the, the, their battery would die, they do not have a limitation when the vehicle's doing that. They can operate that thing for as many hours as they wish, as long as it's providing that safety function. Yet you take that same vehicle to a rest area so they can use the facilities and the, the light bar is no longer being used for safety. They have a five minute limit at that point. So that's kind of the logic thing behind this. There are other exceptions that are shown here. Mechanics have a, an exception for testing, service and repair. If you have something called a queue, which is a line of vehicles waiting to pick something up or drop something off and you're in that active queue, there is no limit on idling while you're in the active queue. If you're using what's called a power takeoff device or PTO to, um, for its intended purpose, then the main engine has to be on in order for that PTO to work properly or work at all. There is no limit while you're using that PTO. I'll give you an example. I'm sure most people in the audience have seen what they call cherry pickers or bucket trucks. You've got somebody in a bucket trying to fix some wires on a light pole or cut down tree branches or whatever it is. And in that bucket and the arm that's on are getting power from the main engine. If the main engine's not on, that bucket doesn't work. And it's a tremendous safety issue at that point. So for purposes of idling limitation, as long as they're using the bucket for what it's designed to be used for and they've got somebody up there, there is no idling limitation. They can idle for as long as they're doing that. Right. Also, the last one on the exemption here is a picture you've got in front of you. It's called a certified clean idle. And these are vehicles with this label on them. This is a label that was put in place actually at the request of the manufacturers of the equipment. Early on, when we were proposing these regulations, they came to us and said, listen, if we can produce an engine that meets a very specific NOx standard that was much cleaner than anything we'd seen before then can we have a, an exemption from the idling limit? And we said, sure, because we didn't think they'd be able to do it. Well, they did it. Uh, essentially, that label means that the engine produces no more than 30 grams of NOx uh, per brake horsepower in one hour. Or 30 grams of NOx, sorry. No, it's 30 grams of NOx in an hour. Uh, that's a mass rate. And if they can demonstrate that that engine puts out no more than that, 
then they can request that sticker and put it on that vehicle. It's not an automatic. You might be able to buy vehicles that meet the standard but don't have the sticker. If the sticker is not on, you do not have the exemption. And the exemption is this. A vehicle that is certified to that standard with that sticker on it is exempt from all idling limitations anywhere in the state of California unless you're within 100 feet of a residential property line or a school property line. And then those vehicles have a five minute idling limitation even with the sticker. Let's get to schools next because I brought that up on purpose. School zones actually have a completely separate idling limit than the one I just went over. This was actually created first, so maybe I should swap the slides, I don't know, but uh, this was created to go after idling of school buses, and it was designed to keep those buses from idling at the front of the school where all the kids were and all the families were and everything was going on, uh, and it actually has worked fantastically. When this first was put in place, we had some issues, but we haven't had to write a citation to a school district for I don't know how long because they just they, they train their bus drivers and they changed their operational um, parameters so that they included this as part of their operation. But the way it works is if you're within 100, 100 feet of a school or residential property line near a school, then you have a zero non-essential idling limit. The buses are supposed to pull up, turn off immediately, Restart the engine and take off no more, no, no more than 30 seconds after they have restarted that engine. Uh, like I said, we don't have problems with the school buses anymore. However, it's really common for us to find issues with other commercial vehicles idling in the same area. And what we find a lot of times is um, that people that are operating commercial vehicles do not understand that there is even an idling limit or that they're within the 100 foot limit associated with the school. Because even though this makes sense to me and a lot of people, the property line is not just the front of the school where the buses come. The property line of the school is the fence line that goes all the way around the track, the portables, everything that's property of the school. If you're within 100 feet of that fence at any given time, you have in your commercial vehicle, you have a limitation of zero non-essential idling minutes. And it applies to all fuels. So it's not just diesel when we're near schools. It's gasoline, it's natural gas, propane, anything that has an emission, it has an idling limitation. So be aware that that is, that is where we get anymore most of the idling citations associated with school zones. I guess I did put the idling limit for off-road here, so that's a good deal. There is a third idling limitation that only applies to off-road diesel vehicles. And it is different than the other two in that the other two that I just went over are regulations unto themselves. They were written at different times, applied to different groups of vehicles, and they are in law as a regulation about idling. The idling limitation for diesel vehicles is built into the diesel vehicle, the off-road diesel vehicle uh, limitation. So it's, a, it's not a separate rule. It's part of that, that existing rule. But anyway, it's the same kind of limit. It limits off-road equipment to no more than five minutes of diesel uh, um, operation, non-essential operation. Uh, let me get rid of that thing here. Hold on one second. I've got people texting me in a different program that I forgot to turn off. Uh, do not disturb. Okay. All right. That should go away in just a couple of minutes. Let's keep talking about the idling limit on off-road vehicles. So it's five minutes. The exceptions are very close to the same as they were. Uh, queuing, maintenance, ensuring safe operation, um, and if you are idling, it's the it's the responsibility of the uh, the user, the renter of the vehicle, not necessarily the owner of the vehicle at that point. If you have large vehicles, that's going to go on for a little bit. I apologize for that. We have a chat program that I've turned my uh, availability off, but it hasn't taken yet. Um, if you have a large or medium fleet, and those will be defined by um, Katie later on this afternoon, you have to have something known as a written idling policy as well. That policy is something that is not reportable to us. It's not something we write. It's something that uh, you have to actually have available for the employees for, who are running your equipment. All right. Let's get into the, well, let me go 
I think I did all the takeaways for Eileen. There's not that much there. Basically, it's five minutes or zero, depending on where you are. And also, depending on where you are, it applies to almost not, uh, diesel vehicles only, except near school zones. Then it's all all vehicles that have combustion, right? any kind of combustion at all. And there's no reporting with any of those. It's just, uh, it is what it is. All right, so let's talk portable equipment. And this is the Portable Equipment Registration Program, or PERP, as well as its associated airborne toxic control measure. First, we have to describe what this is. So let me bring this all up here. And this is where it can get confusing for people because PERP encompasses a lot of things that you may not believe actually have to have permits to operate. So let's talk first about what a permit is. And uh, the way I describe this is, let's say, you know, I live in Placer County and I want, I'm running a business and I want to install a backup generator at my facility. Before I can do that legally in Placer County, I've got to go to the local air pollution control district, which is the Placer County Air Pollution Control District located up in um, Auburn. And I've got to ask them for permission to put that thing in. Now, when I ask them for permission, they're going to give me some questions and I have to tell them what I'm trying to do, how much is all this good stuff about the engine itself. They're going to go through an engineering evaluation to determine whether or not they're going to give me a permit that allows the use of that engine in Placer County. Uh, because the stationary unit is not going to move, I don't have to go anywhere else. I just talk to the people in Placer County and it's a done deal. However, for flexibility, I decide that I'm going to get something on wheels. I'm going to get one that actually rolls around so I can take it to one of my other locations and use it whenever I need to. Well, if one of those other locations happens to be in a different county, then I have a problem. Because as long as I stay in Placer County, that permit system works for Placer County. If I take it to Sacramento County, then I'm in a different zone as far as air pollution control districts are concerned. I'm in the, Sac the, the Metropolitan, Sacramento Metropolitan uh, Air Pollution Control District. I have to ask them for the same kind of permit to operate in Sacramento. So that can get really onerous if you bring this piece of equipment to a bunch of different places. There are 35 local districts in the state. It is possible, and I have actually seen this in my career, to have an engine that has 35 separate permits to operate in the state of California. Now, why is it, aside from the paperwork nightmare, why is it a problem? Because each of those permits is associated with a permit fee. So one permit for one year for one piece of equipment can be $1,000 and I have to renew that permit every year, and I've got to have an inspector out every year to take a look at it to make sure that I'm operating it per the guidelines and the requirements set in that permit. So it, it can be a really big deal. That's why the manufacturers of this type of equipment, portable equipment, and I guess I should describe that. Um, the difference between portable and stationary and any other type of engine is essentially you have four types of engines. You've got on-road mobile, which are your trucks and buses, You've got off-road mobile, which is your tractors, backhoes, bulldozers. You've got stationary, which is engines that don't move at all. And then you've got portable. These are engines that move, but they do not move themselves. They have to be towed from one location to another. So that's how we define the different types. And when you have a portable engine, it requires a very special type of permit, as we're talking about. So years ago, the local districts, as well as the manufacturers of the equipment, came to ARB and they said, listen, um, we don't like this program. We need you to fix this. And so the state of California Air Resources Board came up with this program that you have on the screen, the Portable Equipment Registration Program. It allows for these portable units to be registered on a three-year basis rather than an annual basis. It allows them to be um, permitted through the state so their permit is good anywhere in the state of California instead of a single county or single district. And the rates that are, are that you have to pay to get this permit are less. So I said an annual permit for a district could be a thousand dollars. The annual registration in the PERP program is typically somewhere between the four and five hundred dollar range, or between the seven and eight hundred dollar range, depending upon what it is. And that's where it's going to get a little more confusing, because we all know what engines are: portable engines or portable engines they will fall into this program. Uh, and if for purposes of definition, we'll take any engine that's rated to at least 50 horsepower, but we want greater than 50 horsepower. 
uh, regardless of what fuel it's operating on. It has to be, there'll be some requirements I'll go over in just a second about what it has to be, but that's that's pretty simple. That That's kind of an engine. The second piece of equipment that we will register in this program is something that we have defined as an equipment unit. Now, an equipment unit, by definition, is not an engine. There's no combustion. An equipment unit, by definition, has to be portable, and an equipment unit, by definition, has to produce PM10. Remember me talking early on about particulate matter? Well, this, this device has to be putting out that kind of particulate matter. Well, how do you make PM10 without having an engine? The PM10 we're talking about so far is produced by the engine. Well, we're talking about dust. So I'm gonna give you another example. I don't know if you've all seen this, but it was down my street just a couple of weeks ago. We had a, um, a group of uh, construction operators who had one of those giant grinders. They were resurfacing the road. And this grinder, which was probably about 60 feet long and about 20 feet tall and eight to 10 feet wide, was on tra tank tracks and it was slowly going down the road, grinding up the surface of the road so they could replace it. Now, if we look at that piece of equipment, since it's on tracks, that is an off-road engine operating that. That falls under the off-road diesel vehicle regulation. That's fine, that's covered that way. But what about the grinding unit? The grinding unit that's on the front end of that thing, it's moving, so it's portable. It is uh, not an engine, and it produces copious amounts of PM10. So that grinder, even though it's a component of another larger unit, is considered a separate pollution source with separate permitting requirements. That would be an equipment unit that could get a registration through this program as well before you go you know hog wild trying to register everything and and then asking us questions about what needs to be registered and what doesn't i'm going to tell you this more than once katie and even though katie worked for a local district she worked for san diego for a year, few years uh, we at the state cannot tell you that you need a portable registration on anything because the enforcement of this program, the enforcement of this type of equipment happens at the local level. All the local air pollution control districts have the authority to make you have a permit for each of these types of devices. So if you have questions related to something that you own, whether or not it needs a permit, talk to the local district where you're operating that piece of equipment. All right, that's a lot of talk here. We did amend this in 2019, so let's go through what the basic requirements are. For equipment units, they have to have particulate matter controls. Generally speaking, that's gonna be some type of water in order for us to register them. Engines have to meet one of these following criteria. Generally speaking, if it's not brand new, we will not register it. That means it has to be the current tier for whatever the engine size is. There may be some exceptions, but generally speaking, it has to be whatever the current tier is and the current tier for most engines is going to be tier four final. There are some exceptions to that. The first of which are engines that are called flexibility engines. And I, I don't have the time to go through an entire discussion on this, but the tier program involves requirements changing over time. And when there is a change from a requirement being, let's say a tier one to a tier two, then there is a flexibility program that the federal government allows that allows manufacturers to make and sell older engines even though the requirement has changed for a short period of time. If they do that, they produce those engines, they have to label them as flexibility engines because technically they don't meet the new standard, but they're part of this flexibility program, uh, so they're allowed to be sold. Because they're being allowed to be sold and manufactured, they're also allowed to be in this registration program, even if they're not the current tier. Of course, any engine that's on, uh, as a, used as a secondary engine on any piece of off-road or on-road or harbor craft type of equipment, because we've pulled those into our regulations, we'll also accept that, that secondary engine into this registration program if a local district requires it. If you have a hazardous location, which would be an explosive hazard type of deal, then you certainly don't want to bring an engine in there that has a diesel particulate filter on it because they will be more of a problem in those type of areas. 
So we allow tier three engines if they're used and approved only for hazardous locations. Dedicated snow removal vehicles, uh, anything that works strictly in snow has a problem with filtration. So we, we pretty much give them a pass on having filters. And because of that, we'll take vehicles that you know have these secondary engines, even if they're not meeting the current tier standard. And the last line on here, certified model year 2007 engine. So uh, 2000 model year engine of, applies to on-road equipment. If you're talking about off-road engines, all portable engines, all off-road diesel vehicle engines, or even gas engines, and uh, all stationary engines are all considered off-road. Those type of engines meet tier standards as I've been going through. If you're on-road, you meet either a 2007 model year standard or a 2010 or newer model year standard. You don't meet tier standards. And so the, the emission requirements are slightly different. So we've allowed some on-road engines that are being used for portable purposes to be registered in this program as long as they meet the conditions listed in a particular table uh, that you can find on the website associated with this regulation in this program. If you're interested in getting yourself one of these registrations rather than having a permit from a local district, it is currently still a hard copy application process. Uh, we are in the process of trying to make it online. I actually don't know where we are in that process. Last time I asked, they said it was going to be sometime mid-2020. Well, we're at mid-2020, and I don't know if they've been able to get this, especially with the working from home deal. It's, it's, um, it's something I don't know is happening. But anyway, it's a hard copy application process. The registration fees did go up back in 2019 when this was uh, newly changed. And that process requires that the application be complete or we will not accept it. Once the application and all the information necessary to process it are complete, we will uh, usually take no more than a couple, three weeks to process these, but we have a full 90 days from the day it's deemed complete to do that. If you're submitting a registration for a tier four final engine, you will get a, a, a temporary registration in a few days because we're, we know we're gonna certify those. We know that we're going to register those we're going to allow you to operate that piece of equipment, even if you don't have a final registration. There are labeling requirements, and those labeling requirements show you uh, are shown here on the screen. The label, let's see, actually, no, these are all brand new labels. So you may have an existing label that doesn't look like the ones we've got pictures of right there. The logo will be different. It'll all be green. Uh, but the, since the, when the regulation was modified, we changed the labeling requirements so that the labels will designate the tier of the engine. So Katie did a lot of work to get these different color uh, placards to represent the tier ones in red, the tier twos in brown, the tier threes in green, and the tier four finals in blue. Uh, when you get one of these registrations from us, you're going to get whichever placard is associated with the tier on that particular piece of equipment. It has to be posted on the piece of equipment. You also will get registration documents which need to be kept on site. Here's an issue with this program. It is a registration or permit issued at the state level and we send all the information to the owner of the equipment. However, as I said a few minutes ago, the enforcement is all done at the local level. Because the inspectors are not being given the registrations, we don't send it to the inspectors. In order for them to do their job, you have to provide them with a copy of your permit. So it has to be with the unit. And if it's not, you will get a citation for not having that with the unit. Anyway, that's what we're looking at as far as labeling requirements. Uh, one thing I'd like to mention is if you're purchasing a used piece of equipment that already has one of our registrations, uh, that's called a change of ownership. And that's kind of one of the exceptions to the having to have a brand new engine. If you have, a, if you're purchasing a piece of equipment from somebody that has an existing registration, even though they don't have a current final tier four, you can transfer the ownership of that and keep their permit in operation uh, as long as you do it within 30 days of the sale. Just make sure that happens. You'll, you'll be billed for the renewal fees. You, you have to have that going within those 30 days. Otherwise, it starts over and it's basically a new application to us. There are some prohibitions uh, for both equipment units and for um, engines. For equipment units, the biggest prohibition is that we will not register any 
equipment unit that is emitting hazardous air pollutants. That's why the picture that you see in front of you is there because that is a picture of serpentine rock. Serpentine rock is located in practically every part of the state of California foothills. And the problem with a lot of serpentine rock is it has a high enough asbestos content to be considered hazardous. If you're doing any construction work, grinding of materials, in the hillsides of California, there is a good chance that you're running into this material. And if it is a grinder, we're not gonna permit it if you're using it for that purpose. You probably will have to go through the local district to get a special use permit and deal with their system while you're doing that kind of operation. Otherwise, the equipment units are, are really straightforward as far as permitting is concerned. For engines uh, in this registration program, it's all about not connecting the power to a grid, so generators. If you're operating a generator, portable generator, uh, it's supposed to be portable. It's not supposed to be connected to the grid. If it is, there has to be a circumstance which it's allowed to be that way. I've listed some of the circumstances that are, are available in most of the districts in the state of California. I will tell you there are some districts that are much more stringent about what they will allow and what they won't. And if you happen to have a piece of equipment operational in one of those districts, you're going to have to be care careful about how you connect it to things. Um, you're not supposed to be part of any stationary source. But what I would probably tell you is what I said before, is if you have one of these units and you want an answer about how it's supposed to be operated, make sure that you contact the local district where you are located. If you don't, you're asking for trouble. All right, that's the registration program. Let's talk about the portable ATCM, which is short for the Airborne Toxic Control Measure. This was a rule unto itself that was passed and deals strictly with portable diesel engines operating in California that are a minimum of 50 brake horsepower. The idea for this regulation was to reduce the particulate matter emissions from this category by getting rid of older engines, by restricting the entrance of older engines into the state of California, and then by having fleet emission reduction requirements, just like we do for some of our other uh, reg regulations. If you are part of the ATCM, if you have requirements because you have a diesel portable uh, engine, those requirements will be listed on your PERP registration. This regulation has changed over the last few years, primarily because we were having a problem with compliance. We had a higher than normal level of non-compliance associated with people owning these types of engines. And thus we had to come to the realization that, you know, maybe it wasn't the people, maybe it was the language of the rule. So we went through and we rewrote the regulation and instead of being a fleet average kind of deal like the um, off-road rule is, it is now a phase-out deal. The phase-out is replacing the fleet average standards. And what it means is engines, once they uh, time out based on their tier, they have to be taken out of service in the state of California. And we've also flattened the number of fleet sizes associated with this. We used to have small, medium, and large size fleets and each fleet size had different requirements. Now there's only small and large. If you have 750 brake horsepower or less, you're considered a small, and that's only for diesel portable engines. If you have more than 750 brake horsepower of diesel portable equipment, you're considered large. There's still the allowance for low use and emergency engines to have level three filters and be exempt from this phase out, but generally speaking, that's not an easy thing to do. Large fleets do have an option, they uh, applied for it early enough to still follow a fleet average. Here is the phase out and some things, I'm not gonna read through this whole chart because it's actually fairly simple, but I will tell you, we just went through a phase out. That's why it was so hard, I think, for Katie to get one of those red uh, placards because the tier ones actually phased out as of January 1st, 2020 for all large and small fleets. That'd be the majority of the engines that are out there. And what that means is if you were operating a tier one engine, Regardless of what it was used for, how it was used, if it wasn't registered as low use or emergency use or something like that, then that engine was illegal to operate in its original manufacturer's condition uh, after January 1st of 2020. What are you supposed to do with that piece of equipment? Well, this rule requires you to get rid of it. 
You can't sell it to anybody in the state of California. They can't use it either. They can't register it anywhere in the state of California. And you can see going forward that this phase out uh, gets rid of tier ones, already has, tier twos, and tier threes. Ultimately, by the time this thing is fully implemented, somewhere around 2030, there should be nothing but a tier four interim and higher type of engine in this category operational in the state of California. That is to say, unless it's a low use or emergency, those would be the two exceptions. All right, this was the optional program for the large fleets. I only put it in here for historic purposes because if you happen to be a large fleet, you had to apply for this, it's too late to get in it now. But there are a number of fleets following this rather than the phase out, primarily because they were already following it and they, they had a plan in place and they just wanted to keep going that direction. So that's fine with us, as long as they applied and told us that. Some other changes associated with this ATCM, it depends on where you live, but if you happen to be in the South Coast AQMD, basically the Los Angeles Basin, or the San Joaquin Valley APCD, any of either of those two areas, and you have some project that is extremely large, like more than 2,500 brake horsepower of portable diesel engines, they have some uh, additional notification requirements unless you're operating nothing but tier four final. Any engine brought into the state of California for emergency events has to be certified, which means it cannot be a tier zero, and it's only allowed for operational for one year, and then it has to be taken out again. Uh, we, for low use, instead of uh, keeping, well, you got to keep records anyway, but instead of trying to give those to the local district, you're submitting those to the Air Resources Board every three years during your renewal, uh, because we've told the districts that we'll keep track of that. And the low use did increase when we made the modifications. It used to be 100 hours per year. It was moved up to 200 hours per year. And there is um, a possibility for anybody that has an engine that's getting close to phasing out, that if you would like to drop it into the low use option, that is entirely possible as long as you notify us six months prior to the phase out. So we just had a phase out of tier one engines, January 1st of 2020. Anybody that had a tier one engine that wanted to put it into the low use category could have by July 1st of 2019 applied for and received the dispensation to put that vehicle under low use. And it's good for as long as they can keep it under 200 hours per year at that point. Okay, uh, you, once an engine is phased out, you cannot sell it in California. It has to be sold outside the state. Uh, local districts, the enforcement re is rests with them when you talk about ATCM, just like the registration program. Uh, we, we will handle fleet averages at the registration program, but we don't do any inspections at the Air Resources Board on portable equipment. You know, since you're on a three-year cycle for having your permit renewed, your registration renewed, we do require an inspection in order to get that renewal. That inspection has to be done by a local air district inspector from whoever you're saying is your home district. A little point of reference here, because I know Katie has had this happen to her before. If you are calling a local district to arrange an inspection, make sure that you have the equipment there when the inspector is scheduled to be there. I guess it's fairly common for somebody to arrange an inspection, make an appointment, and then because the equipment's portable and being used all over the place, the equipment is not there during that inspection. A home district inspector cannot inspect something that's not there. And that actually has a tendency to, um, to tick them off a little bit. All right. As far as home districts are concerned, you need to tell us what your home district is when you get one of these registrations from us. Uh, and you can change that every time you renew if you like in the middle of a three year permit registration or yeah, registration period, you cannot change it um, on your own. But if you call the local district that you're moving the equipment into, they can request that and we'll change that for them. So anyway, that's what it is. That's the information I have on the Portable Equipment Registration Program and ATCM. I'm gonna tell you something else you need to be aware of. And that is that uh, I've given you enough information to be dangerous with portable stuff because there is a class, of course, CR101. And don't ask me how often it's held because I don't know. I don't teach that course, but I will tell you that that is an eight hour session on nothing but portable. 
there's that much information available. And it's uh, it's something that changes fairly regularly. And if it were me and I had a lot to do with portable engines, I would probably try to attend that course. All right, at this point. Randy, Kate, before we swap out, yeah. I wanted to circle back because we did have a few questions that kind of came in a okay. little bit after the um, times we were covering the topics. But okay. one is, if someone is idling while queuing, um, but they're within 100 feet of a restricted area, is that exempt or not exempt? If they're in an active queue, that is an exemption. Even if they're in a restricted area, like within 100 yeah, feet of a school? Because that's, that restricted areas are only restricted to non-essential idling. Queuing is considered essential idling if it's an active queue. So the answer is if they're in an active queue, it doesn't matter where they are, that's considered essential idling. Okay. And then we had a question. So if for the PAU regulation, if the engine is certified to that 0 0.01 grams per brake horsepower hour, do they still yeah. need a filter if it doesn't have one? Uh, there's no way for it to be certified to that without a filter. That has an OEM filter. It doesn't have to be retrofitted. Okay, so most likely that engine already has a filter installed? Yeah, I, I don't know of one that can get to that level of uh, particulate matter emission without having a filtration system. Okay, and then that particular person asking the question also happens to work for a um, water district, but it's investor owned. Do you happen to know if that would qualify as a public or a private utility, or is that one that we'd have to check the list? I'd, probably, I'd have to check to be sure, but if it's not owned by a public agency, it would, in my opinion, be considered a private utility. Uh, so it would have to be, but you're also talking about, you say investor owned. SMUD is investor owned. Okay, that's it's owned by the supposedly mm -hmm. owned by the people that um, you know that it serves. That's still considered a public system. Uh, water districts, there are uh, water districts are a weird thing in the state of California. I mean, you've got uh, private ones, you've got public ones, and they're they're all giant, small. They're all over the place. So I would have to do some special research to know for sure. Okay. Was that it? Um, more or less. I think, let's see. So, Victoria, the you're referencing the lighter vehicles with the gross vehicle weight rating. That's the truck and bus regulation between yeah. 14,000 and 26,000. So that's a different class. And if, you're, if your vehicles fall under the truck and bus regulation, then I would just recommend you attend the truck and bus class because It'd be too lengthy for us to try to go over all the information in that. Yeah, that's actually one of the confusing things for people that work for public agencies in their transportation departments because they confuse the truck and bus with PAU. The, they Their vehicles, for the most part, fall under PAU. They don't follow truck and bus. You know, the private utilities are the exception, but uh, that's that's been confusing for a long time for a lot of people. Okay, and then is there any other way we can determine if they're PAU or truck and bus or how can she find that out, find that information? Uh, send me an email and I'll see what I can do. Okay, so Victoria, I'll go ahead and re-put um, Randy's email in here, which is the R op for, right, Randy? Double checking because <laughs> I don't want to get it wrong. Yeah. Okay. All right. But so go ahead and just send him an email and we can follow up on that. Yeah, sorry, I'll minimize this. Okay. Is it everything looking normal on your end? I always like to check. <laughs> yeah, it looks fine. Okay. And then also, Randy, I worked for San Diego Air Pollution Control District for three years, so trying to undersell me here. I said several, didn't I? You said two, you guessed. You said one or two. Oh, okay. I said a few. <laughs> Anyway, hello everyone. My name is Katie. I'm with the California Air Resources Board. As Randy mentioned, I used to work for the San Diego Air Pollution Control District. Um, so I'm going to be talking today about the in-use off-road vehicle regulation, which I actually used to do some of the enforcement on. So hopefully we can get your guys' question answered and give you a little bit of an overview of that program. So the first thing we'll go over is the applicability of the regulation. 
Um, so the engines that we're referring to in this regulation are specifically diesel engines, which run on any form of diesel, including biodiesel. So any diesel fuel in a compression engine is considered diesel fuel under this regulation. This would also apply if you're putting a different type of fuel into a diesel compression engine in an effort to not fall under this regulation. We have had people ask about putting kerosene into their diesel cycle engines in an attempt to not be regulated, and that's not recommended, and it wouldn't make you exempt in any case. Um, when we're referring to diesel fuel, this also includes red dye diesel. A red dye diesel is the same chemical compound as normal diesel, but it's dyed red because there are less taxes on it. Um, that's because it's meant for engines that are not used on road. So this would be construction or stationary engines. The next criteria an engine needs to meet in order to be considered an off-road engine is it has to be self-propelled. So what do I mean when I say self-propelled? The engine has to provide motive force. If you have an engine that drives a compressor and that's on a trailer, you would have to pull that trailer to move it from one side of the site to another. That's considered a portable engine. So what Randy just went over in the last section. In order to be considered self-propelled, the engine has to drive the vehicle. So my easy example of this would be a skid steer that can propel itself, can move itself across the construction site. Um, even if the engine supplies power to something else, for example, a drill rig or a crane, so long as it provides propulsion, it is considered the propulsion engine. In order to fall under this rule, the engine also needs to be at least 25 horsepower. So a lot of times we'll see mini excavators and they'll be rated at 24.9 horsepower. Um, that's exempt under the regulation and obviously that was the intention when they were rating that piece of equipment. Additionally, the engine has to be a true off-road engine to be automatically included. There are a few exceptions to the on-road engine um, vehicles, but we explicitly include them in the off-road regulation for those on-road um, vehicles that are included. One of the things that happens every time a regulation is proposed is we go through a public comment period. In that period, we work with a regulated public to make sure that the regulation is more effective and to try to include things that we may not have initially thought of. So in this particular regulation, the water drilling and the gas drilling community participated in the regulatory process and they made their case that their vehicles should be included in the off-road regulation. This is because their vehicles basically never go off the oil fields. Um, they're not legal to register for on-road use. They're intended by the manufacturers for off-road. So therefore we agreed in that instance and we included them in this regulation. Two engine cranes are also in a unique position because they have auxiliary engines. So this creates a regulatory issue because that secondary auxiliary engine is considered portable um, and it would be covered by the portable regulation. So instead of requiring it to get a secondary permit, we explicitly included them in this regulation to try to circumvent that. Um, something to note with that is that depending on the district you operate in, it may still be required to get a secondary permit by the district. So it's simplified at the state level, um, but you do have to double check with your district. The two engine cranes and water well drilling rigs are automatically included in this regulation. And for the two engine cranes and water well drilling rigs, it, the engine can be any tier, even tier zero, which is not always the case for all the other two engine vehicles. If you have an oil field or natural gas workover rig or a two engine crane, um, your vehicle is in the off-road regulation. If you have a different type of two engine vehicle, it has to meet specific requirements in order to be included. So for the other two engine vehicles, these are the criteria that have to be met in order to be considered an off-road vehicle under the regulation. The first is that the auxiliary engine must be at least 50 horsepower. The second is that the engine has to be certified, so no tier zero engines are eligible. The vehicle must not be subject to the public agency rule, so that one we spent a lot of time on at the beginning of this presentation. Um, no two engine sweepers. The auxiliary engine also has to be designed with the vehicle. So when I say that, it means it can't be a truck with an engine bolted to the chassis or added on in any way after the manufacturer. Um, in that case, it would be an on-road vehicle with a portable engine. So you would have to deal with the state and local permitting for that secondary engine. 
If you have a scraper for grading, those are also considered two engine vehicles and they may either be reported separately if they are detachable or as a one two engine vehicle if they are not detachable. So the main takeaways um, from the two engine vehicles in order to be compliant, the both engines must be reported indoors. The second or auxiliary engine may require a permit with the local air district. Um, whether or not they're required will be determined by the local air district. Typically, the district, uh, the district, if they do require a permit, doesn't have a preference on what type of permit is used so long as the equipment meets the definition of portable, but ultimately that's a district decision. If you own a two engine vehicle and you have questions with reporting or what regulation that vehicle is covered by, you can always contact ARB staff and we'd be happy to help you with that, but we would not be able to tell you if that vehicle requires a district permit as well. So as Randy mentioned earlier, all of our regulations have some exemptions. Um, this regulation does not apply to those vehicles that are used solely for agricultural or forest operations and also does not apply to vehicles that are used exclusively for personal use. Um, the vehicle also, or the, the regulation also has some partial exemptions. I call them partial exemptions because the vehicles are not subject to the performance standards but they are still required to keep records, report, and label. The most common partially exempt equipment is low use. So if you have a vehicle that you can keep under 200 hours per year, it is exempt from the performance standards or emissions related portion of this rule. It is still required to be reported and labeled. Um, we'll get into more specifics of low use a little bit later in the presentation. The next partially exempt equipment is emergency vehicles, dedicated snow removal vehicles, and finally, ag equipment that's used a majority of the time for agriculture, but not 100% of the time. So anything that's used over 50% of the time for agricultural purposes, but not all of the time, would fall under the partially exempt equipment. Again, if the, if the equipment's used exclusively for agriculture 100% of the time, there's no requirement, so no reporting or labeling for that. We'll get into this in a little more detail um, later in the presentation, but for a quick breakdown, the way this regulation works is that you report every piece of equipment in your fleet that meets the definition of an off-road vehicle under the regulation. This includes all vehicles under common ownership, whether they are kept at the same facility or not. Uh, we then use a formula to create an emission rate for each piece of equipment in your fleet, which goes, goes toward your fleet average. The emission rate is based on the emission of grams per brake horsepower of NOx. And the nice thing about this is that the system you report in does all of the math for you. Um, once we have your average, we compare it to a fleet target. The target is a set number that will get lower every year. The target is what um, is based on your fleet size. So the larger fleets will have a lower target. And once your fleet emission rate is higher than your fleet target, that's when you're required to take action to reduce your emissions in order for your fleet to be compliant. The reporting system will automatically exclude your reported partially exempt equipment, um, the ones we just referenced, the low use emergency snow removal and partial ag. The fleet sizes are shown here, and even though there are three fleet sizes, we're far enough along in this regulation that the medium and large fleets currently have the same requirements. So at this point, any fleet over 2,501 horsepower total will have the same requirements. If you have a small fleet, then you will have less stringent requirements. Small fleets are those with less than 2,500 horsepower and also include municipality fleets in low population counties or fleets in captive attainment areas, regardless of the to total horsepower of that fleet. Um, all state and federal government fleets are considered large regardless of their total horsepower. And the takeaway from this is that if you're able to keep your fleet under 2,500 horsepower, that may be beneficial to you so that you have a longer timeline and less stringent requirements. The requirements and compliance dates are dependent on the fleet size. And for the fleet to determine their fleet size, again, they must add up all of their off-road horsepower under common ownership and control. So for example, if a fleet has many subsidiaries, um, all of the of off-road horsepower must be added up in order to determine the overall fleet size of that company or corporation. 
On the previous slide, I mentioned that municipality fleets in low population counties qualify as small fleets regardless of their horsepower. This is a list of the counties that qualify as small fleets due to operating in low population counties. This designation will not change and the counties will not be added or removed from this list. Additionally, these are the municipal fleets that are not necessarily county owned, but applied to be considered small fleets due to their location in a low population county. Individual municipal fleets in these counties are not covered by the low population county municipal fleet provisions unless they are listed by name. So for captive attainment area fleets, those are the ones that operate exclusively in Knox attainment counties. These counties are already determined. No counties will be added or removed from the list. The fleets in the captive attainment areas get to comply with the small fleet requirements regardless of the total horsepower of that fleet. If you have multiple locations you operate out of and one of those locations is in a captain, captive attainment area, you can call the door staff to create a fleet portion for that, um, for that specific subsidiary. And this will allow the fleet uh, portion in the captive attainment area to follow the small fleet schedule, even if your other equipment has to follow the larger medium fleet schedule. It's important to remember that if you portion your fleet, you cannot use the captive attainment fleet equipment outside of the captive attainment areas. The fleets can only travel and operate between captive attainment counties. So these vehicles are designated as captive attainment equipment and they must be labeled with a green background and white letters. This is a map of the captive attainment counties. You'll notice there are some areas that are not connected. That means you're responsible to know if you're operating in Glen or Calusa County. Um, you can't operate that piece of equipment in Butte, but you can cross it over to Yuba. At the same time, um, if you're operating in Santa Cruz and you you can't go up the coastline into any counties until you get to Sonoma. And Sonoma is a little bit odd because it's only um, partially considered captive attainment. It's based on the air basin. So basically the takeaway from this is that if you do choose to designate your fleet as a captive attainment fleet, just be aware of those boundaries and where they lie and consider where the equipment will be operating. This is the list of the captive attainment areas that were shown on the previous slide. Again, if you designate your fleet as captive attainment, just be aware of these boundaries and where the equipment is eligible to operate. So there are two kinds of reporting under this regulation, initial reporting and annual reporting. Initial reporting would be the first time entering all of your fleet's information. The initial reporting deadlines have already passed. Fleets are still encouraged to report as soon as possible to avoid fines. Um, your fleet will not be flagged for a late initial reporting and it is required in the regulation. Fleets can report for free online using the diesel off-road online reporting system or DOORS. This is the quickest and simplest way to report and it satisfies all of the off-road vehicle reporting requirements and it also is a benefit because it retains the data for future reporting requirements. We will ask for information about your fleet as well as the um, information you're reporting. So we don't validate most of the data. And what I mean by that is that for the most part, if things appear to be correct in the information you reported, the system will accept that information. If you miss enter anything, it's your responsibility to verify and correct it. If an inspector comes across the information and it's misreported or doesn't match the vehicles that are registered, they will issue a citation. Um, enforcement has access to the information you input even when inspecting in the field. And if you miss a deadline, um, the deadline for initial reporting, again, there's no penalty for late reporting. If you're caught in the field with unreported equipment, then it will be a citation. Um, let's say that you have all of your vehicles initially reported. Uh, you don't need to add those vehicles in again the next year, but you do need to annually report that there have been no changes. The annual reporting is required for every size of fleet and is called the Responsible Official Affirmation of Reporting, or ROAR. If you have anything to update, this is when you make sure that it is updated. Uh, the person who is ultimately responsible for the fleet should go in and certify that the information is correct. 
If you have low use vehicles, this is also the time when you would go in and report the hour meter reading. The same is true for the majority of agricultural vehicles or any changes since initial reporting. Um, ultimately, we're trying to make sure that the fleet is updated. I recommend updating throughout the year, partly because it's required, but also because if you have a lot of changes to do at the end of the year, it's gonna make it very time consuming um, to do all of those updates when your ROAR report is due. ROAR reports are due by March 1st of each year and it, um, different than the initial reporting, there actually is a penalty if you report late for your ROAR report. And vehicles that are brought into the state of California or added to a fleet must be reported within 30 days of entry into California. So now we'll get into the labeling requirements. Um, once you purchase or obtain a new piece of off-road equipment, you have 30 days to register that piece of equipment into your fleet indoors. When you report the piece of equipment into doors, the system will generate a random alphanumeric number to you, and that's called the equipment identification number. Once that number is generated, um, you're responsible for labeling the vehicle within 30 days. It is not like the PERT program where you will be mailed a label or a placard. The label is something that you have to create yourself. You can acquire them from dealerships, private companies, or even paint them on yourself as long as they meet the standards. Um, typically what the standards are looking for are legible white lettering on a red background. That EIN should stay with that piece of equipment for the life of the vehicle. So if you were to sell that piece of equipment, the EIN goes with it. We, the reason for that is we don't want duplicates in the reporting system. That also means that if you buy a piece of equipment and it already has an EIN on it, you use that same EIN to register the vehicle into your fleet. At this point, all the vehicles should be labeled unless it was just brought into the state, um, like within the last 30 days. As of 2013, labels were required to be on both sides of the vehicle. The reason that we required them on both sides of the vehicle is that inspectors typically didn't want to go onto the job sites if they can help it. Um, they don't wanna interrupt your work. They don't wanna cause a safety risk. It's just a much better option to do a drive-by inspection at the, at the times that you can and just make sure that everything's compliant. The issue is that when it, the labels were only required on one side, somehow the opposite side of the vehicles was always facing out. Um, so we amended the regulation and now the labels are required to be on both sides. The basic specifications for the label that's taken directly from the regulatory language is that the EIN shall be white on a red background, uh, located in clear view on the right and left side of the outside of the vehicle, approximately five feet above the ground, or if a vehicle is not five feet tall, lower on the vehicle. Each character shall be at least three inches in height and 1.5 inches in width. Um, the EIN shall be maintained in a manner that retains its legibility for the entire life of the vehicle. So the really important thing to note from that is that it needs to be legible from a distance. It has to meet the recolor requirements and it needs to retain its legibility. So you have to, even if it gets damaged, it needs to be replaced. Um, inspectors aren't typically going to be going around measuring that it's five feet off the ground or three inches tall, but they are gonna make sure it's in readable condition and the correct colors. Additionally, captive attainment area fleets must make the background green rather than red. There are two main things that are happening if we see the green labels outside of their designated zones. One is that if a piece of equipment was just recently purchased and it already had the green label on it, maybe that person just didn't replace the label. That is something you'd have to do if you purchase that piece of equipment. The second thing that we'll see is if somebody has a large fleet and they have portions and one of those portions is in the captive attainment area, if they pull pieces of equipment from the captive attainment area to work on a project, um, we do see that occasionally and that is a violation. As I said, you cannot use the captive attainment fleet equipment outside of the captive attainment area. So here are some common labeling issues that we see. Uh, the most common is no label at all or only labeling on one side. We will also frequently see an illegible label. So for example, if the label has been partially scraped off due to an incident on the job site or if the vinyl labels, um, get, they get very sun damaged eventually and they fade to the point where they're unreadable. 
In this particular photo, you can see that the label was applied to the inside of the operator cage behind where the operator would sit. Um, this may make an inspector think that the machine is not labeled, and they also could feel that it fails to meet the labeling standard since, as I said earlier, the, the label must be in clear view. Another issue we'll see is when people create a new EIN for a vehicle that already has one. In this photo, you can see a skid steer that has multiple EINs that were applied. Um, each piece of equipment should only have one EIN assigned to it. And this particular piece of equipment was on a job site that had three other pieces of equipment and they were giant excavators um, and they all had the same numbers. So that's an automatic red flag to the inspector who in that case happened to be me. <laughs> and um, sometimes it's just an issue of people writing down the wrong number. So in this one, you can see that there was a EIN in place. It started to get faded. Somebody tried to do the right thing and replace it. It was pretty sun damaged. Um, unfortunately, they swapped that initial G in the EIN to a six. Probably somebody just had bad, bad handwriting. Um, the number letter format of EINs always follows the same pattern, which is two numbers, or sorry, two letters, one number, a letter, then two numbers. If an inspector sees anything that varies from that, they're gonna know that there's some sort of issue going on there. So as Randy mentioned, all of our, or there's multiple limits in the state on idling. Um, truck and bus has idling, school buses have idling, and off-road vehicles all have idling limitations. Um, in this instance, the idling limitation is built into the language of the off-road regulation. The way that an inspector will look at it is to see if the engine um, needs to be operating or needs to be on to perform the function of the vehicle. And if it does not, then it is not essential idling. So you have five, a five minute limit on unnecessary idling. If the idling is necessary to perform that vehicle's function, then there is no limit. So a word of warning I would say with that is that if you do have the good fortune to be caught in an inspection with your off-road vehicles, the inspectors are not going to know every single piece of equipment that requires idling. Um, and for an example, if you have an excavator that needs a 30 minute cool down period per the manual, that is considered necessary idling. But if an inspector walks up to your job site and just sees an excavator running with no operator inside, they're just gonna start their timer right off the bat. Um, that's not to say don't perform the operation, but what I would recommend is having documentation with the equipment in the instances that there are necessary idling. That way you can immediately provide the inspector with that information and it may prevent you from receiving a citation. Some valid reasons for idling are active queuing, maintenance, and safe, safe operation of the equipment, which includes warm up and cool down if required by the manufacturer. It also applies to equipment that has a diesel particulate filter and is undergoing a regeneration, which frequently requires a high idle. You may be required to uh, to prove the equipment is going through a re regeneration if you use that exemption. If you have a medium or large fleet, you have an additional requirement and that is to have a documented idling policy. So that requirement isn't specific, which means that you can decide how in depth that policy needs to be. Um, it could be as simple as a single sheet of paper that says don't idle. It could be in an allowable list of each instance of idling for each vehicle in your entire fleet. That's totally up to you. Um, it's not something that's typically asked for in a field inspection, but it will come up in an audit of your fleet. Some examples of the idling policies can be found on our enforcement division page if you would like a template, but again, they're just guidelines and you're welcome to make this policy however in depth or inclusive as you would like. If you're going to sell equipment to someone who's going to operate that equipment in the state of California, this exact paragraph, which is the sales disclosure, must be included in the sales documentation and retained by you for three years after the sale. Again, this is only if you're selling to someone within the state of California. If you are confident it's being sold out of state or out of country, um, it's not required to include this. A lot of the large auction houses already include this language in their documents, but it's always a good idea to double check with them and get confirmation if that is how you choose to sell the equipment. 
Additionally, we have um, a longer paragraph included in our enforcement division page. And I think Randy and I can provide that if you sell multiple types of equipment. So if you, let's say you sell off-road equipment, portable equipment and on-road trucks, um, we do have a paragraph that covers all of those. So you don't have to figure out the exact paragraph every time you can use one that encompasses all of those options. If you do want that um, language, just feel free to contact us and we can provide you with that. So the off-road regulation includes restrictions on adding vehicles, or as mo most people know it, um, it's called the tier ban. When this rule was implemented and signed off by the federal EPA, the tier ban was the first thing that applied. So the tier refers to the certification of the off-road engine. Um, we have this information in the text version on the next slide, and I'll be showing you a charted version, which is a little bit easier to take in. So this is the tier band chart. Essentially what it says is that depending on the size of your fleet, you're limited on the age of the equipment you can bring in. The exact tier is determined by the engineer and size. So if you have a medium or large fleet, you can no longer add below a tier three engine. If you have a small fleet, you can no longer add below a tier two engine. And in 2023, you will no longer be able to add below a tier three engine. As the engines get cleaner, the tier number gets higher. So currently the highest rating is tier four final. Um, that's not to say that if you have a medium or large fleet, you can't own any tier one, tier two, or even tier zero equipment. Um, remember that this is a fleet average rule. So as long as you own that equipment before the cutoff date and you have it reported, it will affect your fleet average, but it um, there's no ownership restriction on that. So what those older vehicles end up doing is they drive your fleet average up and they make it more difficult to comply long-term. So some of you may be confused because at some point or another, you added a vehicle that was older and you added it after the tier band date. So why would the system let you do that if there's a tier band? There is one scenario where you can add vehicles that would otherwise fall under the band. Um, if you purchase an entire fleet, so long as that fleet was compliant on the date of purchase, you can add all of those vehicles into your fleet, even though um, in, in any other case, the tier ban would apply. So if you purchase an entire fleet that's not compliant, the tier ban does apply. Regardless of the situation, when you're adding a banned vehicle, the system will throw up a warning um, flag that says, this is a banned vehicle, are you sure you want to add? You can click OK and it will add the vehicle. So be aware that if you add those vehicles, they are highlighted when enforcement looks at your fleet. And if you added a banned vehicle after the tier ban and it didn't apply to a, the purchase of an entire fleet, you will likely be subject to enforcement action. Additionally, the tier ban doesn't apply to the partially exempt equipment we discussed earlier, but if that equipment was purchased after a ban date and you choose to use it for another purpose later, the tier ban then does apply. So for an example, if I have a vehicle that I use on my farm and I use it for agriculture 75% of the time, that vehicle is partially exempt. If I decide I want to stop using it on the agricultural side of my business and only use it on the production side, I have to remove that partial exemption and then the tier ban applies. So if that was a tier zero or tier one vehicle, I may run into some trouble um, removing that designation and adding it into my doors fleet depending on when I purchased it. So when you're adding equipment, um, you're affecting your ability to comply. And there are two different ways in which this system allows you to comply. The first option is fleet averaging, which takes into account your overall fleet emission average. The second option is the best available control technology option, um, different than the one we were talking about earlier, but whichever one you use, you have to take action before January 1st of each year in the compliance timeline. So fleet averaging is what we've more or less touched on throughout this entire presentation up to this point. It's based on the NOx emission rate of each engine in your fleet. There is a formula we use to calculate the average using these emission rates for each type of equipment. We then add all of the emission rates together and we compare the average emission rate of your fleet with a target that is set automatically. 
all of this is done in the door system. You don't have to do any of that math. The breakdown of the math is shown in the compliance snapshot page. It's important to note that your target emission rate will get lower over time. If you are at or below your target, your fleet is compliant. And it'll show that on your compliance snapshot page. Emission factors are defined as the emission rate of a device in grams per brake horsepower. The emission factors are predetermined based on the engine model year and the horsepower of the engine. This information is listed on your emission control label, which is located on the engine, and it's all based on the certification from the federal government. So the secondary method that you can use to comply is the backed method, which best available control method, um, technology method. The backed will ignore your fleet average completely, and you do not have to meet that fleet target through the usual methods. Uh, what it requires is a turnover each year. So prior to January 1st, to make your fleet compliant, you are required to turn over 10% of your fleet, um, and that has to be applied to the older vehicles first, so tier zero and tier one first. Backed exemptions are equipments that do not qualify for backed credit. So we don't want you altering these vehicles. This includes vehicles that are less than 10 years old, um, specialty vehicles. Whether or not a vehicle is considered a specialty vehicle has to be determined by ARB staff. If you think that your vehicle is specialty, you can contact the door staff in order to get that designation. Um, but whatever job that piece of equipment does, it cannot be done by any other piece of equipment or a combination of pieces of equipment. If the vehicle has a particulate filter that came with it from the manufacturer, we do not want you altering that vehicle and it is not eligible for back credit upon retirement. Tier four or tier four interim vehicles already meet the standards of the regulation and therefore do not de generate any backed credit. Uh, for medium or large fleets, if you installed a filter on a piece of equipment, that piece of equipment is not eligible for backed credit until six years after the installation. Sometimes for a particular piece of equipment or size of equipment, there is no filter available. Um, something that I will mention is that if you installed the filters prior to 2013, and you received early credit for that piece of equipment for installing that filter, that piece of equipment is still eligible for BACT. Um, this is for those fleets that started complying with our first version of this regulation that required filter installation, and then we lost the loss in lawsuit, so we no longer use that version of the regulation. We didn't wanna penalize people for trying to be compliant early, so that's why we offered the early credits for the filter installation. So if, if that applies to you and you retire those pieces of equipment, you do still generate backed credit. If you have an ultra small fleet or a micro fleet, which would be fleets less than 500 brake horsepower total, you can follow an alternative compliance path. That compliance path is to phase out tier zero and one vehicles starting with 25% in 2019. 50% uh, by 2022, 75% by 2026, and then no vehicles left, um, no tier, or sorry, no tier zero or tier one vehicles left by 2029. This is not considered fleet averaged or backed method. Um, the total horsepower in these cases does take into account vehicles that would not be subject to your performance standards. So your low use emergency vehicles, snow removal vehicles, they all count toward your total for that 500, 500 horsepower limit. Um, this option extends your timeline a bit and allows you more time to meet the tier two standard. You cannot opt into this option yourself. You have to take, or you have to contact the door staff in order to opt into this option. If you have a piece of equipment that can be operated less than 200 hours per year, or if you have a piece of equipment that already operates less than 200 hours per year, you may benefit from using one of the low use options. If it's a two engine vehicle, both of those engines have to stay under 200 hours per year. The two options for low use, um, there are two options for low use. Both of these options require the equipment to be equipped with non-resettable hour meters um, just to be able to accurately report the yearly hours. 
if you go into the system and you opt into low use, it automatically puts you into the year by year option. The reason for that is because it's the more flexible of the two options. The ways that it's flexible are, um, we don't just use your last year's hours to determine your usage. We take the previous three years and have a rolling average of those years. So let's say that you used a piece of equipment 250 hours one year, 100 hours the next year, and 205 the year after that. You would still be compliant um, using the rolling three-year average. If you go over the 200-hour rolling average, that vehicle goes back into your fleet. So it will affect your fleet average, that, but the tier band doesn't apply and there is no citation. Alternatively, when you designate a vehicle as permanent low use, you are essentially guaranteeing us that that vehicle is going to be used at a negligible level. Um, so an easy way to think of it is that we give you credit as if that vehicle has been sold. So you receive a backed credit for retiring the vehicle, but you must stay below 200 hours per year. The benefit to that is that um, if you're not going to meet your fleet target the next year, this is a really easy and cheap way to get those backed credits. You don't have to pay for filter installation. Um, you just have to commit to using that piece of equipment under 200 hours per year. The downside is that if you do go over 200 hours per year, that backed credit goes away. The adding vehicle restriction or tier ban applies um, because again, you essentially sold that vehicle. So that would be like you buying it in a, you know, in a new year. And then additionally, you will most likely receive a citation for exceeding the hours. So finally, um, we have some regulatory assistance here for you. Um, these are the resources available. The off-road zone has a section um, specifically for diesel fleets. You can access our training schedule there and it's updated pretty regularly. There's also the Knowledge Center with some training videos on the website and fact sheets available. It's a good resource if you have questions and it's typically the first place that I look um, just for resources for people. You can also see the titles of the classes we offer. If you want the specific off-road regulation course, it's MS504. And if you have any additional questions about your fleet, we also have the DOORS hotline where staff is available via phone or email to assist you with compliance planning, regulatory questions, or help navigating the reporting system. And I think that finishes it up. Let's see. Yep. So Randy, I don't know if you want to open it back up for questions and put the timer up. Yeah, let me get that going here. Sure. Uh, let's see. Uh, delete. And I'll put. I'll pass it back right. to you. Yeah, go ahead. It's already up and going. Okay, all right, you guys should see a timer going on. I already had it going. We're gonna go for um, the 10 minutes and in that time frame, if you have questions, go ahead and ask Katie uh, in the questions dialog box and then uh, we'll, we'll you know, answer as we can. At the end of the 10 minutes, we'll shut everything down.
Okay, so we have a question. Do you regulate fug fugitive emissions from off-road equipment? Um, the short answer is yes. The long answer would be typically it's going to be the local air districts that are going to cover fugitive emissions. So, and a lot of times those are related to um, citizen complaints. So if you do have off-road equipment and you're operating it in a way that dust, you know, comes off of it or crosses property lines, um, then you will potentially get inspected, but most likely by a local air district inspector.
Okay, Randy, we have another question. In particulate matter non-attainment counties, are there any special requirements for on-road diesel emissions um, other than the backed or filter? Um, there's no different ones for those non-attainment counties, uh, not from these regulations. These regulations apply statewide, so they they're didn't differentiate between non-attainment and attainment for these rules. And then even in the rules where they did differentiate between attainment and non-attainment, it's not the particulate matter. So right. should be the same for all those for particulate matter. Right. It was Knox that they did the differentiation. Right. All right, doesn't look like we have any other questions, right, Katie? Actually, one just came in. Um, but so the recorded webinar um, isn't posted automatically. You do have to email either Randy or myself for that. Um, but if you do that, we can get it to you probably by tomorrow. Normally, it takes a couple hours for it to generate, so we won't be able to get to that tonight. And then I'll resend our emails in the comment just because I know they're we're past that slide. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Well, so give me one minute and then you can shut us down. I don't think we have anything else from there. Okay. Okay. So I sent that in. If anybody wants to record our emails, they should be posted on that last comment. But I think other than that, if there's no other questions, then I'll have Randy go ahead and shut the webinar down. All right. Everybody have a good day. Thanks for attending.